As an organization dedicated to serving youth, we've always aimed to bring scouting to as many youth and families as possible. With that goal in mind, we've introduced phenomenal programs to appeal to varied interests and ages, such as venturing, exploring, Sea Scouts, and STEM Scouts. Those programs have proven incredibly valuable in enabling us to deliver character and leadership development to youth who may have thought that scouting was not for them. Now as life gets busier and busier, we've heard from families and scouting leaders throughout the BSA that there is also a need to help make scouting more accessible. When we speak of accessibility, it not only means convenience for families balancing jobs, school schedules, and extracurricular activities, but it's also a matter of cultural access, realizing that many of our communities and younger parents we are just beginning to serve prefer to do things as a whole family unit. As such, accessibility also means that we need to address how we consider the daughters in the families whose sons we've traditionally sought to serve. While some communities already offer other character development programs that serve girls, that's not the case everywhere. And that reality is seen as we hear from many leaders and families in the community that talk about how their daughters desire to participate in scouting. As parents bring these realities to light, we've done some initial research to determine the extent of this interest in scouting and have started elevating this conversation so we can determine the best path forward including a recent focus on the topic at the 2017 National Annual Meeting when Chief Scout Executive Mike Serbaugh outlined what we know so far on this vital issue. Those in attendance were asked whether we should continue this conversation forward, noting that the next step was to seek and acquire earnest and sincere consideration and input from our scouting community at large, from you. Across all regions, there was strong feedback that encouraged us to continue the conversation and seek that feedback. With that encouragement, I'm honored to bring the conversation to you, our local leaders and volunteers, seeing that you are best able to help us assess the real opportunity, need, and imperatives from your unique perspective. Within the next half hour, you will hear a consolidated version of Chief Serba's presentation from the National Annual Meeting. After reviewing this presentation, we hope that you will also engage in thoughtful and respectful conversation about the topic as a group yourselves. You'll then be asked to provide your email address so that we can send you a survey soliciting your direct feedback as we consider the next steps in this important conversation. Your candid feedback is extremely important to us as we determine the correct action and direction for the Boy Scouts of America at this critical point in our history. Scouting's founder, Lord Baden-Powell, and the early leaders of the BSA faced those issues in their day. We now have a similar opportunity to address these issues and want to make the right decision for the Boy Scouts of America, for our youth and their families, and for this great country. Thank you for all you do to bring scouting to life in every corner of the country. We're honored to serve with you in strengthening the rising generation and helping prepare them to meet the challenges of life. And thank you in advance for taking the time to discuss this important topic with the attention it deserves and for providing your candid feedback. We look forward to hearing from you soon on this very important issue. Since I've been in this job and before I came to the National Service Center, no matter what group or organization I went to that was associated with scouting, there would be the question, what about girls? And I think it tells us that there is a pull from the organization to in some way do something. But I have to say that these images, I believe in that. I believe in the single gender aspect of the Boy Scouts of America. I believe in the power of what scouting does for young people. I experienced it when I was a kid, and many of you did too. There is something very special about being together with other boys and having a chance to learn leadership skills, to be able to try things and take risks and have adventures and be in a zone where you're feeling safe and you're supported but you can extend yourself a little bit. I think there's some things that only happen 
in a single gender environment in that way? How do we find a way to try to deal with forces and trends that are affecting our movement and our organization, maintain the single gender aspect that has been a powerful driver of character and leadership and values, and maintain our adherence to the Scout Oath and Law? To have the experience of seeing Scouts grow. What I'd like to talk about first is what we know. What do we know about American families? How have some things changed? And if you picture your own experiences, your own picture of life when you were growing up, maybe it was the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there are some trends that make our program design a little more challenging. 60% of families have both parents working. I think about that. That creates some pressures on the family. It creates a compression of time that people have to spend with their kids. 27% of all families are single parent households. In some of our underserved markets, in some of our newest emerging markets, that number is significantly higher. Now we see that all families have less free time and this number really stuck out to me. Over a third of parents feel they spend too little free time with their kids. Isn't that what we're all about? We're teaching parents Here's how you play with your kids. Here's how you have fun together. Here's how you grow and learn in a program that's based on fundamental values of the Scout Oath and Law. So these are things that we know that families are more diverse and millennial families look at things a little differently in how they access programs. What else do we know? We've got what parents want. We absolutely have a program that parents say they're looking for. So I think the desires of millennial parents aren't significantly different than the desires of parents in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, or even in 1910 or 1920. We know that parents still want the same thing for their kids. They have that same aspirational vision that they will grow into great citizens and leaders, but they have challenges in accessing the program. The program access has become very important to them. And there was one little line that's underlined, one-stop solution. You see this particularly with the markets that we tend not to serve as well, our non-legacy members. They're looking for a place to bring their whole family. Well, th that kind of makes some sense. You, you might ask, what data do we have to support that? We've got tons of data. We know what parents want. We know what Latino families want. We know what Asian families want. There are some cultural differences. Asian families particularly want things that are educational in nature for their children. Hispanic families want things that maintain their cultural identity. We know, and many, many businesses know, a lot about our potential market. How does that translate to scouting? How do we create an avenue for them to say, I've got a limited amount of time, I want these things for my family, do they see scouting as relevant? I would say they see scouting as highly relevant in what our program delivers, but do they see the way they come in as easy? Is it a frictionless experience for that family to come in and get what we've got? Well, let's take a look at our membership trends. And when I was out in the field, there was a period of time that I was pretty convinced I knew everything that was holding us back in membership growth. I didn't believe we had a fundamental problem of going to schools and recruiting kids and passing out flyers. You go into a school classroom, you can get eight-year-old boys excited. You talk about fire and knives and rockets. You got them. They're with you. So we know how to get the kids in, but there was something holding us back. So I, I think I had a picture that maybe wasn't entirely accurate. If you look at that graph between 1995 and 2015, I thought it was a controversy. Now, controversy doesn't help. And I think controversy can accelerate a membership trend to the decline. Millennial moms particularly don't like putting their kids in organizations that they would see as potentially controversial. So we know that that time that we struggled with some issues, it didn't help us grow, but I don't think that was a real story. I think there was a trend line that had been going on a very long time before and that probably just accelerated it a little bit. And the reason that that's somewhat validated is when Dr. Gates was our president 
And this board voted and removed some elements of controversy from our organization. It gave us a platform to start growing. The last two years have been relatively controversy free. And what's happened? Our membership has stabilized. Our membership hasn't grown, but it's become stable. If you take out our Lion Pilot and you take out Exploring, what we have is we have still a slight net decline. We're still following that same trajectory, but we're not unique. Girl Scouts, they're the green line. You notice their peak was exactly the same as ours. Now their trajectory is a little bit different than ours, but not a lot. Now you would think if it was all about our leadership standards controversy, we would probably have a very different experience in the Girl Scouts, but we track quite similar to them. The one at the top, you don't really see the scale there, but that's the PTO and PTA. PTAs between 1970 and 2010 dropped 5 million, from 12 million to 7 million. Now the little red line at the bottom is the Elks, but you could also put on there the Kiwanis, the Rotary Club, the Lions, you name it, everybody's following generally the same trajectory. These are legacy organizations that I think are reflecting a trend in today's families. Life is different. There's more stresses on our times, and I think that service clubs and others have reflected some of those trends. Well, how was our program designed? What was our workforce? I think that we're not unique in a workforce or a design flow that is completely unusual. Do you remember an era where you and your family went on Friday night to this store and it had this big blue sign over top of it and you, you perused thousands of these little boxes and you would pull out one of the boxes and you would go home and you would watch a movie in your video cassette recorder. And at the end, you had to remember to push the be kind rewind button, otherwise they charge you another 50 cents. All of a sudden, there was a disc that came in the mail and it became a little bit easier to access. And then the disc wasn't quite good enough. There was a new machine, it's got a Blu-ray player, and everybody had to get a Blu-ray player because the quality was enhanced. You had more pixels and things that the techies would say create a better viewing experience. And that also came in the mail, so it was a fairly easy experience to access. Then the world changed, and now we have the ability to stream on mobile devices. The content is available almost any time. I would contend that the people that probably got left behind in that model were the people trying to invent the next Blu-ray player because they were thinking there's got to be a better machine that replaces this one that gives more pixels and a better viewing experience. Here's what happened. The quality was good enough. It became all about access. How do you get what it is that you want? Well, I would contend that our program is not good enough. Our program is spectacular. Our content absolutely delivers character. We do not need to transform into something else. The Boy Scouts of America does not need to become a school-based program that we give out classroom curriculum materials. We are an outdoor education program that delivers high value, but we have a problem with access. Remember her? That was my den mother. When I was a kid, I went to her house on Tuesday afternoons at four o'clock with a lot of other little boys, and we had an experience there. And then at home, Cub Scouting was delivered around the kitchen table. Parents sat and did the advancements. Now you think about the way that we deliver Cub Scouts today. We have an incredible Cub Scout product that came as a result of the 411 project. We have dynamic content, but it has to be delivered in the den meeting. Why? because the parents don't have as much time to sit around the kitchen table to do the program. So unless they do it in the den meeting, what happens? They don't advance. If they don't advance, we don't retain them. So I would suggest that almost every program modification we've made in Cub Scouting has not been a result of an inadequate curriculum or content, but it's been because of structural changes that have happened with the family. You can't fight those trends forever. 
We have creative, innovative programs that are described all across America. I get introduced to district executives all the time. You have to come and meet Sylvia. She's doing amazing work, and she's doing this creative, innovative program, and she's working with Hispanic families, and she's bringing tons of them in. Here's how she's innovative. She's creating a workaround to a structure that doesn't work anymore. What she's doing is she's taking Cub Scouting and she's delivering it to all the families because the families come out and in a very convoluted way, she said, well, the girls are in Learning for Life and the boys are in Cub Scouting and they, come on, what's the program? It's Cub Scouting. She's delivering Cub Scouting to the whole family. Most of our innovative programs are really trying to struggle and deal with the structure as opposed to the content. So my point with all that is I don't think that we have to overthink this and create something that we're not. I don't think we need a whole new program to serve the entire family. I think that we have something people want, but they don't have an easy way to get it. So we've got that problem, single gender. We believe in it, we want it, we wanna maintain it. We've got a problem of trends that are against us in creating time demands on the family and a way that people don't see an easy access point for scouting. I think it, it leads to a question that we have to ask ourselves, and that's what this is all about. Uh, I heard some folks say that they're coming to the national meeting this year because there's gonna be a big announcement or pronouncement. There's, there's none of that. There's no big announcement. There's, there's not a, a grand plan. This is a discussion. And I hope that you feel this is a good time to have this discussion because we are not under imminent threat. We don't have huge pressure to make any change. I think that's probably the best time for us as a group to say, what does our future look like? Because if we believe the market intelligence, if we believe the data, then we're gonna continue to face challenges of how to serve the whole family. And that's either gonna come down to creating other new programs or figuring out maybe there's a way to take what we have and deliver it to the whole family. This plan is not my own. This plan has come as an evolution from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that have given pieces of input. And it's also come from what our own membership has said, this is something that we need to talk about. Do we believe the Cub Scout program is relevant for young women? Is that content, does it make sense for young women? Perhaps another way to look at it <clears throat> is the Scout Oath and Law gender specific. If we think that the content is relevant, then is there a way to first identify what our parents even want that? Well, here's the studies that we've been doing. 68% of our current Cub Scout parents say if the program was available today to their daughters, they would immediately put them in. Cub Scout parents think that it is relevant for boys and girls. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about why I think we see that all around us every day. This is the big number, non-scouting families. That's who we're trying to track. When we presented a program without the Cub Scout brand label on it and said this is, this is the program itself, this is what it looks like, 90% of parents said that if they could involve their boys and their girls, their children, their family in it, they want what we have. That's the market. This is not just about potentially involving little girls or sisters of our current Cub Scouts, this is about creating a demand and an avenue to serve the whole family that are non-legacy members, that don't have three generations of Eagle Scouts in their family. So if we felt that that was true, then is that validated? Well, I think at this point we have mostly anecdotal evidence. And what I would say is that when we've had other controversial issues, you hear from the negatives first, and you hear in a big way. On this one, it's almost all positive. And the positives, some of them are form letters, about half. The other half are people that describe experiences in their Cub Scout packs. The girls are actively participating. They don't have a way to exclude the girls in a way that still involves the whole family. So there's frustration. You, you see a lot of frustration in these letters. Now, have we quantified that? Do we have good data on that? We don't. But I think in talking to so many scouters, I hear that all the time, and I think we at least have to recognize that there seems to be a demand for that. So what I would suggest is if we thought first that the program could become relevant for boys and girls, 
here is a possible way for discussion only about how you might be able to involve the whole family and maintain the single gender aspect of scouting. If you believe that your Cub Scout pack for boys only, either because that's the wishes of your charter partner or the wishes of your parents, you just feel that you've got a pack that's working great right now, it's just boys, you want to maintain that, why not? You continue having a pack for boys. If we answered that other question and we felt that the program was relevant for girls, could you have a girl-only Cub Scout pack? Requires no more work on our part to create, no additional infrastructure, same number of leaders. But in the middle, could you have a family-based pack that is not co-ed? What it is, is Cub Scouting for boys and Cub Scouting for girls. It's not dissimilar from some history that we have. At one point in time, we created an organization. We funded it, we staffed it, and we put together a board, and it's called Campfire Girls. And we did that to try to meet the needs of the entire family. And in many small communities, you would see Campfire Girls and Boy Scout troops that were meeting in the same place. And they would have a joint opening, and the boys and the girls would separate for the program times, and they would come together at the end. We see that now with other programs partnering with other organizations serving some different constituencies. We have 20,000 kids in a program for Vietnamese scouting. They do it in the same way. They allow the boys and girls to come together, but they separate in their program times. So what I would suggest is that you could have Cub Scouts for boys and Cub Scouts for girls with boy dens and girl dens. For most packs, when you've got a critical mass, you could have dens for boys and girls. And I would contend that all those letters that have been coming in and all the stories we hear about PACs that are trying to involve girls, this would probably create a greater separation of the gender than what we have now, because it would actually be an avenue to have dens for girls and dens for boys. If you had that structure, what we would need to know is what happens later. When a girl's gonna graduate from Cub Scouts, now, most groups that I've talked to, and this has been a very limited audience that I've had a chance to share all of these conglomeration of ideas with, but most have said, you know, I like the idea of girls being a Cub Scouts. It makes sense. It fits with my experience, but I'm concerned about what happens next because they're going to graduate from Cub Scouts. I think at that point, you only really have two options, and we would have to resolve that before we moved forward at all. We would have to continue to discuss how would we deal with the girls after they graduate from Cub Scouting. We could find a partner organization, perhaps, but I think that that partner organization would have some pretty strict criteria. They would have to have a national reach. They would have to have shared values. I think they would have to have a curriculum and a robust and rigorous set of requirements to get to the top rank, and that top rank would have to be seen as equivalent to and no less than Eagle Scout. If there was a partner, that made sense, that at least is a consideration. If you couldn't find a partner, you've still got those girls graduating. You would have to form your own program for girls. And if you did, there's some big things and some pretty emotional topics that we would have to wrestle with. First, if it ran parallel to Boy Scouting, how similar is the curriculum to Boy Scouting? Some would say it ought to be exactly like Boy Scouts, because if it's not exactly like Boy Scouts, then girls couldn't get the ego rank. There are others that say that would be the worst thing we could possibly do is to allow young women to get the ego rank. It's a big one. And I don't think we have good data to tell us what the right way is to go. I also think that it probably is going to break down by demographic. There's a lot of young women and a lot of young men who are Eagle Scouts that tell me if, they, if the girls work just as hard, they ought to be Eagle Scouts. I think there are others that would say, this is one of the last things that boys have in America, is the Eagle Scout. We can do nothing to harm boys. We need to maintain the integrity of that Eagle rank for boys. That's something we would have to wrestle with. We would also have to make sure the community at large knew that Boy Scouts is not a program that's co-ed. Boy Scouts is a single gender program for young men. And if we had a single gender program for young women, it would need to be seen as equivalent to. So do they advance to Eagle? What about the Order of the Arrow? Well, that would be a big one. Would they have their own organization? Would they be a part of the Order of the Arrow? It would have to be resolved. I don't think you could go in 
halfway and say we're going to allow girls to be in Cub Scouting but not have these things identified that must be resolved. So what I would ask this group to do is consider a proposed structure that would have a mechanism for bringing in family Cub Scouts of boy dens and girl dens, also packs that are single gender, boys and girls, and offering that as an option for chartering organizations and parents. And then ultimately, one of two things needs, I think, to happen next. And we're going to have some opinion surveys that we're giving to each council. And this is opinion. It's not a vote. There's no vote happening. This is strictly an opinion on where you think we should go next. And it really just goes one of two ways. I would tell you that if we want no controversy as an organization, the quickest way to avoid that is to stop discussing this today. If we want no further conversation on this topic, I think we'll still get some pull internally from our organization. I think we'll still get PACs that want to involve girls. But if we want to stop the controversy of any kind, we can very easily release a story to the media that says we looked at this as a group. We could not figure out how to involve the whole family and maintain the single gender aspect of scouting. So at this point in time, we're not going to discuss it. That would be the opinion of stopping. Going forward, would be you are asking our executive board to start looking at those things that had to be resolved, the big ones. And at such point in time, if those things were resolved, that the board would eventually have to vote to change its bylaws. This is a big one. And, and I don't want to undersell in any way how significant a change this would be for our organization. I would also say it would not come without a great deal of controversy. I think when we left here, if we continued to go forward with that discussion, if you felt that was the right thing for our board to pursue, we will probably have negative media attention. We will probably have those that misinterpret what we're trying to do and suggest there's other reasons for it. I would say to this group, we're under no pressure to make this decision, but I think that it's a topic we have to look at, we have to address because those trends don't go away. You've heard from me, I've given you the pitch, I would hope that this body gives a strong indication to our board one way or the other. This is an avenue we should pursue, or this is the point where we should say there has to be some other way to grow our membership. Because I think if we do nothing, we can continue stabilizing the membership, but I think we'll have a slow erosion over time. I think the trends don't lie. 